as usual, a quick reminder of what we did last week. I talked to you about confidence intervals, even more confidence intervals, and some of them uh, were are shown here. So, <coughs> confidence interval on a correlation coefficient, the sampling distribution is not really known. I mean, you, you, can, you can simulate it, but you can't calculate many things here. It's asymmetric, and you want to find this central 95% of your data. So what you do, you use this Fisher transformation, which transforms this distribution into a Gaussian distribution with known mean and standard deviation, and then you can do your probabilistic calculations and find necessary interval. For proportion, <coughs> the approach is slightly different, but we still use a sampling distribution of proportion, which turns out to be a binomial distribution, and then we can use this which is a standard error of, uh, of a proportion. <clears throat> this works all right when your proportion is not very small, not very large, and when your n is quite big. Where, where <clears throat> but if you have small proportion or large proportion, then this doesn't work very well. And I gave you equations to do some uh, corrections which make this work. But these corrections are still based on the standard error of a proportion. I gave you some equations for a very nice and accurate approximation of confidence intervals on count number where you just calculate these two numbers and that's, that's your confidence interval. So it's fairly simple. And I also mentioned very briefly uh, bootstrapping which is a technique, computer, a very <coughs> computer intensive uh, technique which might be used when everything else fails. So that was Basically, two lectures full of confidence intervals and all this complicated stuff, and this is finished now. So now, for something completely, completely different. And that will be about error bars. So there will be no equations in this talk. Maybe there will be one, I think. <coughs> and I will show you ways of plotting data with error bars and also reporting, quoting data with error bars, how to do it correctly and how to do it incorrectly, because there are very w many ways of doing this, not, not very well. <clears throat> Let's start with an example. This is what I would call a good plot, a reasonably good plot. It's got all the elements you need in a, in a publication quality plot. You have axes with, with numbers, there are descriptions, labels here, it tells you what it is. There are units, which is quite important, don't forget about units. There are data points with error bars, and there is some model uh, fitted to, to the data and there's a full description in the caption of this figure telling you what it is and how it was calculated. So this is how we could do this. So um, let's, let's first uh, try to have an overview. So I will give you three sort of a general rules of making good plots. So what you need to keep in mind is clarity of presentation. Now that's the first rule. The second rule is clarity of presentation and the third rule is clarity of presentation. If you keep this in mind, everything will be fine and just follow, follow your instincts and you can probably make a very good plot. Uh, there are a few examples how clarity comes into it. <clears throat> so these are not proper plots. There are no axes here. There are no labels. There are just representation of various symbols. This is about lines and symbols that you can use. So it's better to keep it simple so instead of symbols like stars, complicated visually symbols, it's better to use something simpler like a circle or a square. If you need more symbols, maybe a triangle. But try not using these complicated things. Uh, if you want to distinguish between two data groups, don't plot them in the same color with the same symbol because it's very difficult. Use different colors, maybe open symbols and closed symbols. Make them visually different. Uh, if you have lots of data points, Avoid using symbols that are quite big because they will overlap and you can't see a thing here. It's better to use smaller symbols, smaller than in this graph, uh, so you can distinguish individual data points. <clears throat> Sometimes this, as presented here, doesn't work when you have a lot of data points. You probably can't see it, but some of these data points are closed symbols and some of them are open, and this is a complete mess, so it's indistinguishable. Instead, sometimes it's not always applicable, but you can sometimes use a line instead of dots. Just join the points and you have two different lines in two different either colors or shades of gray. It's easier to read. So again, clarity. Uh, the last example is slightly different. 
It's about lines and joining points with lines. So if you go on the internet and read various recommendations and rules how to plot graphs, many people will tell you never ever join the points with lines. Okay? This is one of the rules many people uh, recommend. I would tell you this. This sort of a graph where you have individual points and you join them with a line, I would say it is okay. It's not the best possible way, but it's okay. As long as in the description of the graph you say that lines are for guidance only because they don't really mean anything. If you, if you have this data point and this data point, it doesn't mean that data in the middle corresponds to this value. There is no interpolation here. It's only to guide the eye, especially when you have several, more than two, three, four, five groups of points. That might help. This is a bad example, and I have seen it in, in, in real life. Someone joined these lines with a spline, which is a sort of a locally fitted line. And this graph might suggest to you that there is a certain model um, fitted to data, and the model reaches maximum here, not at this point, but somewhere there, which is not true. Uh, if there is no underlying model, you can't use a spline just to join lines. Either you have a proper model, you fit it to your data, and then you plot the line, or you don't use line at all, eventually, or, or you can may, maybe use uh, just straight lines for guidance, nothing else. So that's about lines and symbols. Labels, uh, make them visible, first of all, and clear and easy to read. And this is uh, something that plagues many talks where people take a figure from a paper, then convert it into a JPEG with low resolution, and then zoom it out and, and show you something like this. I've seen it in many talks. And of course, there's no way. You can't read what is here. So if you want to show a, a plot like this, you have to either tweak it and increase fonts and prepare everything. Or if it is not your, to uh, no, not your, um, if it is not your plot, you might add these things manually in, in the presentation. I will show you later how this can be done. But make sure that all labels in a presentation are easy to read, even from the last row. Can you read it? So don't do this. Another thing I wanted to briefly mention is using a lot of, of logarithmic scale and logarithmic plots. So there are a few examples of data shown in a linear scale in top panels. And here there are examples of exactly the same data, but shown in a logarithmic scale. So logarithmic scale allows you to show data, present data nicely that spans many orders of magnitude. And you might be tempted to create a plot like this. This is some abundance versus time, where you can see that nothing happens here. There is a sudden growth if this is in a, in a linear scale. But if you do it logarithmically, uh, you can see much more. These three points here are basically the same. You can't tell what happens here. Well, here you can see that they follow roughly a straight line in logarithmic scale, which means there is an exponential increase in, in abundance. And you can probably fit it with a line and, and do some calculations and make conclusions. So that's much cle clearer way of, of showing things, much more clear way of showing things. This graph shows um, uh, that was RNA seq expression data, I think. Calculated, uh, well, it's shown only for a certain range of values. I wanted to show this bunch of data points, so unfortunately, some other points are missing. If you can see here, this graph goes from 0 to 500, and 500 will be somewhere here. So these points are not shown in the graph, they are outside it, and there is some data missing. If you try to show all of this data in a linear plot, there will be a very tight, small bunch of plots, points here in the corner, and almost nothing there. So it's not very good. Uh, logarithmic scale, you can see everything quite nicely. This is the same data, but plotted as a frequency distribution. And again, in linear scale, it's concentrated here. You can't see much. In logarithmic scale, it looks almost Gaussian, with a little sort of a shoulder here. Uh, so you can interpret these data and see how, how they behave. That's a comparison of two conditions in a typical box plot. That looks nice. It shows you that this, uh, in this condition, the gene is much, has much higher expression than here. But I think it's better to show it here, especially the data seem to be log normally distributed. You see, this is very uh, asymmetric. This is much more symmetric. It's basically the same thing that happens here. So if your data are intrinsically log normally distributed, it's always better to plot it 
in a logarithmic scale. So how do you plot error bars? Well, <laughs> that's a very, very sort of a cartoonish uh, uh, diagram. So this is your value that you, you are trying to plot. And you plot the middle point, uh, which could be a mean, median, whatever estimate I use, and plus minus error bar with a little cap at the end just to help guide your eye visually again. And if you write it down, that will be mean plus minus standard deviation or mean plus minus standard error, depending what this is. So actually, standard error, for example, if this was standard error, would be half of this full bar. So this is the, the entire bar from this cap to this cap would be two standard errors. This is the convention. Or this error could be a confidence interval, which you write down as interval like this from M lower to M upper. Or you can write it down like this. The confidence interval might be, and quite often is, asymmetric. If you remember proportion and correlation coefficient, you usually get asymmetric errors. And if you want to write it down in a mathematical form as a number, this is what you do, m plus upper error, m minus lower error. So this will be upper error, and that here would be a lower error. And you put these things in a, in a diagram. If you have arrows in one axis only, then this is what you do. In two axis, you can do it this way. Uh, when, and again, clarity is important. If you have lots of points and they are very dense, I wouldn't do it this way with this little cap and black arrow uh, bars. What I did here, I removed the cups, so arrows are just straight lines, and I made them gray so they don't dominate the figure and you can still see actual data points very clearly, and you can also see error bars. And when you make bar plots, I will come back to this in, in, in a few minutes, make sure that you can see both sides of your, both arms of your error bar. So make sure your error bars are visible, whatever you do. Now, I mentioned this before, but it might be worth repeating this again. What are these errors for? So generally, you are probably going to deal with three types of errors. Standard error represents, uh, sorry, standard deviation represents scatter in the sample. And it might be good for, for example, for comparing two or more samples. You can plot data or means with standard deviations, and that will show you the level of variability in each, each sample. Well, box plots are probably better alternative here, unless you need to plot hundreds of points in one graph. But if you have only a few samples, then box plots are probably better. Standard error is used very often, and it's the error of a mean. Uh, so as I said, it's most commonly used error bar, though I think personally that confidence intervals are actually better because they give you some statistical intuition. And confidence interval gives you confidence in the result, and it's probably the best representation of uncertainty. And always state what type of uncertainty you are either quoting or, or plotting. That's very important. Okay, box plots, so I mentioned box plots. One of the ways of plotting data is a box plot. I'm sure you are probably all familiar, but just a quick reminder, at least for the representation I'm going to use. There are several uh, percentiles of data. So this is the, the, the bottom whisker is the fifth percentile, and this is the 95th percentile. Fiftieth percentile is basically the median. And here this is from the 25th to 75th. So this box contains central 50% of of data, and that's actually data only. It, there is, it's a non-parametric way of presenting things. You don't have to calculate mean or standard deviation or anything. And whiskers contain 90% of data, and sometimes you can plot outliers. Well, they are not really outliers. These are just points which are in the top and bottom fifth uh, percentile. You can show mean, but the, the whole idea that, as I said, it's non-parametric. It, it shows data, sort of a pure representation of data without any assumptions. If you calculate the mean, you give an estimator of the, of the mean. So it's, it's, it's the next step. This is the most, the simplest thing to do, actually. And you can plot box plots this way at, on a categorical uh, axis like this. This is the body mass of your mice. Uh, sometimes I add a, sort of a little cloud of points, original data points, so you can see them where they are. They are randomized in x direction, so they are kind of scattered here, and they plot actual values of each data point. Sometimes it is useful. Uh, you can see this is um, sequencing quality of, of reads um, as a function of read position. 
And this is an easy way of presenting lots of data points. Each, each box plot here contains millions of data points. So in one graph, you can, you can really show a lot of data. Now, bar plots, all right, the bane of my life. Uh, bar plots are, are very useful for, and very good for some very specific narrow type of data, and they are quite appalling uh, for other types of data. And unfortunately, in biology, they are used over time everywhere for everything, and it's not good, really, and I try to explain you why. <clears throat> So the first thing you notice is that area of a bar is proportional to the value presented. So for example, this bar shows some value of probability, which is about maybe six or seven percent. And its area, as you perceive this visually, it's all about visualization. Its area is proportional to the value which is presented. And you can see, for example, that this bar is twice, roughly twice the size of this bar. Its area is bigger. The next thing you notice is that summed area of several bars represents the total value. And in probability distribution like this, the shaded, the darker area, corresponds to the probability of k being between five and seven, which is just added these three probabilities, and it's 0.32. And your brain will, if you look at this, your brain will kind of add up this area and will tell you this is the total area and corresponds to the total probability. You can take this total area, or even look at the, what fraction of the total area of the entire uh, graph this constitutes. This is something you can perceive visually. <clears throat> so bar plots should only be used to present something which is additive, because you add here probabilities. So it could be either counts, or fractions, or proportions, or probabilities, or something similar. But you probably should not be using bar plots to represent speed or mass. I will show you some examples in a moment. And another thing which is very important for uh, bar plots is that, well, uh, not only vertical axis is important, the horizontal one is also important. If you create a bar plot, uh, plotted against a continuous variable. So this is a discrete variable, and you can have it also a categorical variable. But if this one is a continuous variable, then the width of the bar is very important. Because, so th this shows a score of some predictor collected from many, many, many simulation results, and this is a frequency. So it tells you that in this particular bin between zero and 0.1, you have maybe 110 points collected and fewer here, and so on and so forth. So the width of the bar really does matter. These bars are actually two-dimensional. Now, there are consequences of these things. And the first consequence is that all bar plots should start at zero, okay? So, as I said, bar area represents its value, and you have two values presented here in this graph. Control is 400 and treatment is 800. And you can see this area is twice the size of this area because they start at zero. If you rescale your axis, vertical axis here, and zoom in into a little bit, you can present the same data in a very misleading way because this bar now is much, much larger than, than this one. Well, actual, the, the, the difference is one is 400 and another is 800. So if you do it this way, this plot will be very misleading. So the baseline, this one here, must be at zero. Every time you create a bar plot, it has to start at zero. So you can't do this. The next consequence is that you can't do bar plots in logarithmic scale. I hope this is obvious for, <coughs> for everybody, but I need to mention this. Because, well, obviously there is no zero in the logarithmic scale, you can't do it. So the baseline here, uh, the beginning of the y-axis is completely arbitrary. You can choose it here, you can choose it there, and depending on where you choose your point, each, each time this graph will look different. And, uh, well, it's not just real data, it's what you, what you select as, as an arbitrary threshold here. So, don't do it. More problems with bar plots. <coughs> uh, well, this is, a, this is a plot with a few problems. So first of all, this quantity is non-additive because that's speed in some micrometers per minute. It shows some value. Uh, 
So again, your, your, your visual perception is that you, your brain will tend to add up these bars together and, and collect area of two, three and more bars. But this is very, very false feeling of what this graph presents because uh, you can't add things here. Uh, and another problem here is there is very little variability in these data. So this graph is very much compressed and you can, it's difficult to compare these points. If you plot it this way, then you can see individual data points very clearly. You can see arrow bars and you can see that first two data points are different and these are more or less the same. So it's much easier for, for your eye, much better representation of these data. Now look at this one. <coughs> I actually have seen a very, that's almost a copy as I remember it from one of the presentations. Someone made a graph like this. Uh, there is lots of problems with this. Uh, Sorry, I forgot to add, um, that's how it's going to look like. Okay, I will put it on. That's time. So that's distance against time. <coughs> First of all, non-additive quantity, so it doesn't really work. <coughs> Another problem is, because there is this pattern of darker and brighter bars, and there are white space, black bar, white space, it creates this very confusing visual pattern, which is not easy to read. You have to spend a little bit of time to see where the actual data points are. Because the first thing you see is this, this pattern. Then, of course, it's very crowded, so you, you, have to, you have to look for these points and see where they are. And another problem, I will come back to this in a moment, you can't see the lower uh, arrow bar here. You can see only upper arrow bar. So some data are missing, actually, from this graph. <clears throat> and another problem is that this is a continuous variable, and this is a multiple bar plot. I will come back to this in a second. It's much easier, in my personal opinion, it's much easier to plot these data as a, as a scatter plot using two different types of symbols and maybe these lines just for guidance, they are not really necessary. And you can see trend of this going up, this one going, sorry, down, this one going slightly up and then staying and so on. So yeah, this, this is really not very good. Now, what I meant by this, um, <coughs> uh, the, the continuous variable here, okay. So this is a plot which I saw in a, in a seminar talk only a few days ago. I won't be pointing fingers. Um, and I, I kind of reproduced it from memory. So this is simulated data. What this plot is trying to show you is a score. It's a frequency distribution of some score in three different categories represented by three colors, blue, green, and yellow. And it's trying to show and compare these two thing, three, three things. They start quite high here, then they go down and they go up again. And you can see that, for example, blue is stronger here, yellow is less strong, and so on. However, there is a very fundamental problem with this plot. Namely, the bin size, because all these things are bent. The bin size is 0.1 here. So all these bars here tell you that you take your scores and then count them. And there are that many, about 120, scores between 0 and 0.1 in a blue bar, and maybe 105 in green bar, and maybe about 80 in yellow bar. But the blue bar itself, you see its width is here. It extends from just above 0 to maybe 0.3. So the blue bar suggests that data are collected in this very narrow uh, range of values, but they are not. They are collected from here to there. So it's very confusing. The other thing here is that because of how this is presented, there are three shifted uh, bar plots here. So the blue data are shifted to the left, the green data are in the center, and yellow data are shifted to the right. So if you want to compare them, you are comparing things that are not really comparable. So this is a very bad representation. Now, <clears throat> what can you do about it? So one thing, you can do it properly as, as histogram, like this. Uh, so this graph is correct, but probably not very easy to read. So if you see what I was trying to do here is the blue bar is here and goes down here, here, and so the, this is a blue line representing a histogram. And this time the bar, the bins are correct. So the first bin is from 0 to 0, 01, and it's represented by three things, yellow, green, and blue. And also there are arrow bars, which I had to shift a little bit to left and right so they don't overlap. And it creates a little bit of a messy picture. If you spend some time, you can read it. But it's not very easy to read. At least it's correct. And I think the best way of doing this is just present it separately. So each of these plots here is a correct 
bar plot. So this blue bar really corresponds to this range of values here and it shows you what they are. It makes comparison a little bit more difficult, so perhaps you want to show these three plots and this one, but this is definitely incorrect. And that's the last thing about bar plots <laughs> I wanted to show. Uh, truly, I cannot really get my head around why people do this, because it's so obvious and it must be just some default settings in software that people use. So what you have here is a bar plot. There is some wild type here plotted for comparison, which is actually redundant. It's a useless information because you have your scale from 0 to 100. But the real problem is that you can't see the lower error bar. And if you want to compare visually data and say, hmm, do my error bars overlap or not? Is, is the difference statistically significant or not? You look at this, you can't imagine, well, this bar probably reaches this point, so these two bar error bars, they do not overlap. Well, tough, because this is error of proportion, and if you, is, as you know, error of proportion is asymmetric. And it turns out that the lower error bar here, this lower arm, is much larger than the high one, and these two errors overlap a lot. And if this is a 95% confidence interval, that probably means but there is no statistically significant difference between these two points. So if you do it this way, you're just, you're just missing some of the data. And as I said, I really don't know why people do this. But you, you can see it in nature, you can see it in any paper. You know. It's everywhere. <clears throat> so always show upper and lower arrow bars if you do bar plots. Um, in this particular case, maybe bar plot is not really necessary. You can do much simpler plots with just two data points and arrow bars. You can zoom in a little bit so you can see it a bit more clear and you can see how error bars overlap here. Or perhaps, do you really need a, a plot here? It's just two numbers with errors. So maybe it is enough to mention them. Or if you really want to show it, I would suggest this way. But yeah, at, as a minimum, you really have to show both sides of the error bar. <clears throat> right, it's a little exercise for you. Uh, <coughs> How do you perceive uh, overlapping error bars? So I made it more difficult. So what you see here is uh, six pairs of, of data. Uh, there are samples, and for each I calculated mean and a standard deviation. This is standard deviation, which may, makes comparison more difficult. And you will understand why you should not use it, really. So tell me, think for a minute, maybe, and you can make some marks on a piece of paper. Which, um, which pairs are statistically uh, different, statistic, sorry, significantly different and which are not? Look at significance and in, in difference but, uh, between these pairs. So uh, by statistically significant difference, I mean difference between the means. So for example, there is mean here, mean there, and error bars. Are these two means significantly different and for each of these pairs. Try to guess. Oh, this is the sample size here. As you can see, it's different. Okay, this is just a guesswork. You, you don't have to calculate anything. Right, let's, let's go through them. This one, are these two things significantly different? No. no. What about these two? Probably yes. Probably yes, okay. Well, this one, <laughs> maybe. Probably yes, maybe, no, okay. What about these two? Yes, that looks like a consensus. What about these two? Yes. Yeah, no? Yes. Mixed, mixed response. These two? Yes. Yes, right. <laughs> what you can see here, I added, apart from standard deviations, I added standard error, so this is the small black, thing, black arrow in the middle, and the red thing, red arrow bar, is 95% confidence interval. And you can see all the p-values here. So basically only these two are really strongly uh, significantly different. This one, yeah, some of you said yes, some of you said no. P-value is 0.01, so for a biologist it's probably enough. <laughs> <laughs> Others, well, this one, marginally. Some of you said also maybe. So yeah, this is sort, sort of a also maybe. Uh, one thing you can, you can notice, and this is quite useful if you want to quickly estimate whether things are similar or different. If you look at standard, sorry, at confidence intervals, in particular at 95% confidence intervals. So look, 
These two red things, they overlap a lot and p-value is high. These two, they overlap a little bit, p-value is lower. Uh, these two, st they still overlap. P-value, well, 4%, you might trust it or not. But look, these red bars, they do not overlap. They are completely separate and p-value is very low. Here, they are very close to being overlapped. P-value is sort of a smallish, and you can't see it here because they are very small. The, the sample size is very large. But that is a very crude rule of thumb that uh, when 95% confidence intervals overlap, the difference is not significant. But to do it properly, of course, you need a proper uh, statistical test, for example, a t-test. So these p-values come from a, from a t-test. But for a quick estimation, this is, this is a nice, nice rule of thumb. Okay, there are now two slides which I'm not going to read. I just leave them for you. They are in your handouts. This is sort of a, basically what I told you about creating graphs and about bar plots. Everything is summed up together. You can use it later as a, as a reference. Now, before we go to the second part of the talk, I, I thought I really need to mention this person, William Playfair. Has any one of you ever heard of William Playfair? One, two, okay. As I suspected, I never heard of him until recently. So, <clears throat> he was born in Lyth, near Dundee, so a local boy, but it was in 1759. Um, and according to Wikipedia, and this is a, as a quote, he had many careers. So he was a millwright, engineer, draftsman, accountant, inventor, silversmith, merchant, investment broker, economist, statistician, yeah? pamphleteer, translator, publicist, land speculator, blackmailer, swindler, and eventually convict in this particular order. He, he was jailed for, uh, for fraud. Banker, editor, and journalist, so very Renaissance man. He did almost everything. And despite all of this, he died in poverty. But for us, what is important, he invented line graphs and bar plots and also pie charts. In 1786, he published a book which contained lots of bar plots and line graphs. And also later on, he invented pie charts. And then everybody followed after him. So this is a chart from his book from 1821, showing at one view the price of the quarter of wheat and wages of labor by the week. It's a bit complicated, but you can see here. So this is time on the horizontal axis. This is 16th, 17th, and 18th century. And this is price in shillings. So this is what I did with this plot. The original plot, you see numbers here and labels, they are completely unreadable. And it's because it was published in a big book and it was a fold out. So the actual plot is this size. So all the letters are very small, you can't read them. So I basically added my own labels here to make it easier to read. And this is a bar plot of a price of a quarter of wheat. This is not really a proper correct bar plot as, as I tried to explain to you now because this is not really an additive thing. And this bar plot also sort of hangs midair that these bars do not extend properly here. So it's, it's a little bit weird. But the reason he used it is because he integrated data in five year intervals because when he tried to plot individual data points, they were very noisy. So he basically applied a little bit of smoothing. And this line here represents wage, weekly wage of a good mechanic, as he said. This is what's written here. So you can see from this graph that probably somewhere in mid 18th century, it was, it was good to be a mechanic in terms of wages. And yeah, that's, that's one of the first bar plots ever. Right, let's, let's quickly now go through the second part. It's about quoting or reporting numbers and, and errors. Uh, well, when you write it in a publication, you usually write something like this. X is your best estimate, plus minus symbol, and then there is some sort of an error. Okay, and errors can be, as I mentioned, standard deviation, standard error, confidence interval, or some more complicated derived error. Make sure you tell the reader what error you use, again. And how, how do you calculate these things? How do you type it? So first of all, we need to uh, revise the idea of significant figures or digits, it's basically. The same. So significant figures are those that carry meaningful information. It's a, it's a simple definition. 
So more, more significant figures in a number, you have more information. What is important that the rest behind significant figures, it's a meaningless junk. And you don't want to publish junk, do you? So quote only significant figures or significant digits. And this is an example. So consider a microtubule that has grown 4.1 micrometers in 2.6 minutes. These are measurements. What is the speed of growth of this microtubule? Now, if you take these two numbers, 4.1 and divided by 2.6 using your pocket calculator or, or phone or whatever, you will get this number. Uh, it's very long and messy, and actually it's a, it's, a, it's a periodic number, so this seven repeats again here. This is six, nine, two, three, and so on. So this, this bit from here to there is, is repeated. And of course, if you quote it, that's just rubbish. I mean, most of this number is, is completely irrelevant. It's a numerical noise. And you can see it because in your original numbers, in speed and, and distance, there are only two significant figures. So presumably, this is all that's significant. And therefore, only about two figures in the result are significant. There are ways of estimating this better. I will show you in a second. But your, your first guess would be there are only two significant figures. So you want to quote only 1.6 and ignore the rest. So which figures in a number, if you write down in a number, which figures are significant? Okay, so first of all, non-zero figures are significant. So if you have number 365, there are three significant figures. If you have 1.893, there are four significant figures. That's quite easy. Now, zeros are a little bit confusing sometimes. So leading zeros are not significant. So numbers 34, 0 0.34, and 0 0.00034 they carry basically the same amount of information. The information here is 3, 4, and an order of magnitude, which will be 2, uh, 0, and minus 3, or something like this. So the amount of information is exactly the same. So they all have two significant figures, as you can see here. Now, trailing zeros, uh, it's a bit dodgy. So before the decimal point, they are usually not significant. If you write a number like this, it probably there is only one significant figure, but it depends on, on context. If you report in a newspaper that 4,000 people gathered in a market square, that's an approximate number, and presumably only one figure is significant. But if you write in your paper that we used 4,000 mice, that might be an exact number. There might be four significant figures. So it's, it's not clear how accurate this number is. So you can go around this either, either at a quantifier, say exactly 4,000, or write it like this. That would mean that there is only one significant figure and this is sort of magnitude, so it's one. But if you write it down like this, 4.000 times 10 to the 3, that's four significant figures. That would be six, because these two zeros, if they are written down explicitly, if they are significant, and the same is here. That will be two significant figures, that will be four. So accuracy of this number is much higher than accuracy of that number. Okay. And once you know how many significant figures you have, you can round your result. The rules are very simple. You look at the next digit. If it is between zero and four, you round down. If it is between five and nine, you round up. So one, two, three, four, would be, if, if there are two significant figures in these numbers, that will be rounded down that will be rounded up to 1,300, and the same is here, 1.5 and 1.4, despite this being 999. So this number, if you round it, it will be 5, and then would trigger this one up. But if you have the whole number, that's still 1.4. That's just a little rule. Okay, so, but you, you need to know how many, how many significant figures are in your, in, your, in your result. So how do you do this? Well, so in order to find how many significant figures you, are, you have in your number, we have to look at its error. You do it the other way around. So you use, we use sampling distribution of the standard error. So error has its own error. There is error of the mean. There is also error of standard deviation. There is also error of the standard error. And that's what we are going to use. And if you look at the width of the sampling distribution of the standard error, this is basically your uncertainty. And it can be shown that it's expressed by this formula. And I think this is the only equation in today's talk. So if SE is a standard error, then error of this error is represented by this. SE divided by a square root of 2 times n minus 1. 
And the same formula, it doesn't matter what you use here. You can use standard deviation or a confidence interval. Okay, let's have a look at this example. So if you have a sample of 12 points, and when you calculate its standard error using a computer, for example, it gave you this number, rather long number. When you put it in this equation, you will get that the error of the standard error is about 5, which means that the true standard error, which we don't know, this is only an estimator, remember, the true standard error is somewhere between this minus 5 and this plus 5. This is, let's say, 19 and 29 with about 68% confidence. This is not a true confidence interval, but it approximates about 68%. So we don't really know very well this standard error. Definitely we don't know these numbers. This is just noise. So if it is between, let's say, 20 and 30 or so, we can be only certain, or we can trust only in one figure, the first, the most significant figure, which is this one here. So instead of 23 or 23.7 or whatever, we can only write down as 20, because this is as much as we know about this number. The rest is just noise. So what you do, you, you find your error in the error, and, and that tells you how, how uncertain your error is. So, <clears throat> and here, here are a few examples. This is a sample size, and this is the fractional error of the error. So this error divided by standard error. Okay, so for 10, n of 10, and this is very simple, similar to what I, what I showed you here, the relative or fractional error of standard error is about 24%. So you really don't know standard error here, it's very vague. You can only trust one figure here. If you have 100 data points, then this fractional error is about 7%, so you can't, you probably start trusting the second figure, just. And you go down, with, with 1,000 points, it's 2%. You can only trust two figures. When this becomes less than 1%, you might start trusting the first figure. So only when you have 10,000 data points, you can show, you can plot or uh, uh, type three figures of your error. So if in a paper someone writes this, and I've seen this before, 2.567 plus minus 0.165. There are three significant figures in this error which implicitly suggests that this person had 10,000 replicates to calculate it. You don't have 10,000 replicates. I've never seen 10,000 replicates in my life. So uh, th this is just incorrect. Actually, the six and five are probably pure numerical noise. They don't mean anything. They are meaningless numbers. Okay, so how do you use it now altogether? This is the, the, the recipe for, for calculating and plot, uh, sorry, printing errors and numbers. So first of all, if you have a number, you need an error on it. So you need number and its error. Then you use the, what I told you a moment ago to find how many significant figures you have in, in your error first, using error in the error. And typically, in most biological applications, it will be one or two. And then you quote the number with the same decimal precision as the error. This is what it looks like. So the actual number you calculate is 1.23 and all these little digits here, and this is the error. And then we found that error has only one significant figure, so all this stuff is noise, it's just junk, so all what is left is 0 0.02. And now we align both number and error at the same decimal point, and with both cases we reject this numerical noise. And the final number is like this, 1.23 plus minus 0.02. And this is a correct way of quoting a number and its error. That will be incorrect because error and number are written down to a different uh, decimal precision. Uh, the same is here because error is 0.5 and this is a very, very, you know, accurate number. So probably it's supposed to look like this. Similar here, if you have 3.0 suggesting that you have two significant figures, then your, your number also should be there. If you have numbers which are integer numbers um, and you know that this number has only two significant figures, then you should write it like this. You just round it to the nearest thousand. And in exponential notation, remember to use brackets because otherwise this is a bit ambiguous. You don't know whether this times 10 to minus 5, whether it affects only 0.3 or 3.5. That's, that's the way to report it. This is, this is your prescription. It works every time. Okay. Um, now, what, what do you do if you don't have error? 
<coughs> a number without error. So I would probably tell you go back to your lab and do more experiments. That's the best way of doing this, but I know that it's not always possible. And sometimes you just quote numbers which are kind of vague or rough or approximate and you don't need to show error. It's, it's possible. So these are quotes from various papers. This one says that centromeres are transported by microtubules at an average speed of 1.5 micrometers per minute. And if you quote this, you presumably, you mean that both figures are significant, so there are two significant figures here. So the error of this number, well, we don't really know it, but it might be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, something like this. It's not very much larger, it's not very much smaller than this one. So we, we use this um, sort of a rule that all quoted figures are presumed significant. You wouldn't quote more uh, here if, you're, if you have only two. You can use these twiddles, the, the tilde symbol, to represent approximate um, numbers. So this, this calibration method reduced error rates by about 5%. This is order of magnitude, or roughly, or about. Uh, you can say 30 minutes, that transcription increases during the first 30 minutes. This is a bit vague, but you know, it's about 30 minutes. It's difficult to say how accurate this number is. And if you find a sentence that cells were incubated at 22 degrees, you as a biologist, you probably know much better how accurate this if you know the experiment. So presumably it's plus minus one degree, plus minus half, whatever. If it was plus minus 0.1 degree, then presumably that should be quoted as 22.0 or 22.5 or whatever the number is. So there are two kind of vague rules here that there is an implicit error in the last significant figure. So that will be, th this figure goes up and down with the arrow a little bit, and all quoted figures are presumed significant. Um, I have to mention this because I've seen it again too often, uh, avoid computer notation. I've seen, that's actual quote from a paper, I grabbed one paper on the shelf, opened it, and oh my God, it's this again. So someone said p-value is 5.51 e minus 14, it's just a copy and paste from a computer program. This is not a way of writing down you know, numbers, really. You should do it this way. So first of all, I don't think that p-value is accurate down to three significant figures. It's almost impossible. It's difficult to, uh, to estimate error of a p-value, but in most cases, there will be just one or maybe two significant figures in most p-values that you calculate. So I, I just don't believe this number. So it should be rounded to six, I think, and write it down as six times 10 to minus 14. And that's, that's the correct way of doing this. <laughs> this is a figure I received very recently from one of my colleagues. No finger pointing again. And uh, you have these silly numbers here. This is really difficult to read. This is a bit absurd. And unfortunately, this is one of the standard settings in, in, in Excel. So if you, if you put your data in Excel and don't pay too much attention, don't play with your numbers, you can get this because it just is a standard output. It's much better doing this this way. So if you have large numbers, you can say intensity times 10 to the sixth and just plot 0, 10, 20, 30, it's much easier to read. This is intensity in millions. So don't do this. Um, another problem I encountered is fixed decimal places. So the problem is if you have raw data in Excel sheet, uh, Excel easily allows you to, to round data to, the, to a certain number of decimal places and you can do it like this. If you say, I want one decimal place. This is actually a screenshot from Excel. So I, uh, this is how it works. <clears throat> and of course, if you quote these numbers exactly, there is something really wrong with them because the first number has six significant figures, then it's five, four, three, two, one, and this one has no significant figures at all because this value is completely lost here. It's, it has disappeared. Maybe, maybe in this case, the error is really about 0.1, or, but it's very unlikely. In most typical biological applications, the error, uh, the fractional errors are very similar. So the bigger the number, the bigger the error. So presumably uh, the error of this number is much larger than error on this number. They are not quoted, so we don't know. But if you want to estimate number of, if you want to do it properly, you have to estimate number of significant figures. And if the number of significant figures is two, for example, this is how you should do this. And you should write 1.4 times 10 to the four and so on and so forth, and including the last number, 0 0.022. So avoid, avoid uh, fixed decimal places. It will lead you to something very weird. All right, so that's the final slide. A quick summary. Well, what to do, how to quote numbers and errors. 
When you know the error, well, you, you calculate the error and estimate its uncertainty, and this will tell you how many significant figures of the error you need to quote. And typically, it's either one or two in most applications. And then you quote the number with the same precision as error, like in this case, or this one. This is rather unlikely in biological experiments, but this is a correct thing. This is how we do this. And there are a few more examples. If you don't know error, well, you still need to guesstimate your error. That's, that's something you have to do. So quote only figures that are truly significant. So I, I really don't believe if p-value is that accurate. It's probably 0.03. Use common sense. Try estimating order of magnitude of your uncertainty. So for example, if you use a microscope and measure distance between two spots, and a computer software will give you this number, but the resolution of the microscope is 100 nanometers, then obviously you don't quote this, you should quote just 400. And there are rules for rounding numbers. So that's for you to keep in your handouts. And that's all for today, thank you. <laughs>